myself on mute. Hi, mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, welcome to today's uh, CDAR Risk Seminar. Today, we are uh, um, taking full advantage of our Zoom capabilities uh, to bring you Alexander Braun from far away, uh, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, uh, where um, also our, our CDAR affiliate, Olu Mahmoud, is, is also on faculty. Probably be hearing more from her during the semester. So Alexander is going to be talking to us about uh, hurricane risk and insurance. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks everyone for inviting me around. Um, I'm excited to be able to present that paper um, that you just mentioned, just trying to share the slides. If you could just give me a quick sign, whether you can see it, um, perfect. So the paper is called Hurricane Risk in Asset Prices and it's a joint work with uh, Julia Braun, she is not in any shape or form related to me. That's a pure accidental, uh, you know, it's a coincidence that she has the same surname. Uh, she's a doctoral student here at the university and then Florian Weigert, who is a full professor of finance at the University of Neuchâtel, also here in Switzerland. So what we um, are motivated by is the fact that in uh, recent years, uh, the economic losses uh, caused by natural disasters, particularly by atmospheric events such as hurricanes, have uh, increased uh, significantly. So if you take the combined damages um, of the three years 2017 uh, with that major hurricane season in 2018 and 19, uh, you get about to um, 600 billion US dollars, which is more than the GDP of Sweden. So this, this is really becoming uh, an economic factor and uh, the major reinsurance companies, for example, are also doing a lot of research in that area and trying to find out how uh, these natural disaster risks are going to impact us uh, from a systemic point of view. So then why hurricanes and why not other types of uh, natural disasters? Well, one point is that hurricanes uh, are also going to be impacted by climate change and, and this this piece of work here is also related, um, as I'll point out later on, to, um, you know, to, to the emerging literature on climate finance. And so that's one point, um, but also hurricanes are obviously the most violent type of disaster um, that households and businesses face in the US. And they also occur on a more regular basis, um, and that's going to be important for the empirical uh, strategy that we have than, for example, major uh, earthquakes. So if you want to measure something like a risk premium uh, in asset markets uh, that relates to natural disaster risk, then hurricanes are a more natural uh, type of disaster to choose than uh, earthquakes. And then, um, you know, if you look at hurricane risk more um, in detail, then you see that it actually has the property uh, properties of a, a proper systematic risk factor. So it's geographically widespread. Usually a hurricane touches uh, several states, not just one. They can move inland. So it's not just the coastal states uh, that are directly affected. Uh, and then if you combine that with the fact that we have these economic links uh, that ha have been increasing further and further over the last, let's say, two or three decades, uh, the um, e economy is actually much more networked uh, than it was before. So hurricane risk can actually spread through the system uh, much more easily nowadays. Um, they're economically severe, I already said that, and they follow a clear pattern over time, uh, namely the hurricane season. So you have uh, you know, pretty much all the risk jammed into the period between June and November and outside the hurricane season, the risk is virtually zero. So it's negligible. And that is an interesting property for um, empirical identification. And then the last point is we don't have uh, enough insurance. Uh, so, um, you know, from an economic standpoint, the full consumption insurance hypothesis is, is, is violated. So um, this is a figure from, from Munich Re. Uh, from a study by, by Munich Re, the big um, reinsurance company, who says that only 5% of homeowners in the US are insured against flood losses um, related to hurricanes. So that means we have these huge protection gaps and, and therefore households and businesses are actually impacted uh, and the risk is not shared properly throughout the system uh, and therefore, um, you know, 
negligible from the, uh, the standpoint of, uh, of a household or a business. So just a few um, stylized facts uh, before I move on. Um, this is one of the graphs that we show in the paper. And uh, what you can see is the AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. It's basically an index that measures the surface temperatures um, in the North Atlantic. And from scientific research, we know that the surface temperature is directly related to hurricane activity. So to the number of hurricanes that you would um, observe also to the severity of the hurricanes and also to the capability of those hurricanes to move uh, further distances. And as we can see here, and this is a, a sm uh, moving average of, the, um, of that AMO, you can see that around the mid 1990s, um, we have entered into a warm phase that lasts until today. So I'm, I'm uh, not speculating whether this is due to climate change or um, it's just uh, whether it's just a natural uh, fluctuation um, because this AMO is known to go from warm to cold phases over um, over decades. The fact is we're still in that warm phase and what you can also see is that the losses and these are normalized losses so they're adjusted for population growth, inflation, uh, and also um, the growth in, in, in uh, property prices in those areas. Uh, these losses have gone up. And so this cannot be driven by you know, the fact that we are um, cramming more and more uh, value into disaster prone areas because the losses are normalized, right? So this has to be related to the fact that um, you know, something has happened with hurricane risk in that period. So the, the, the average loss has basically doubled compared to the, the period before, where it was about 10.5 billion, and here it's about 23 point something billion. So we have a significant increase in the average loss in those periods. And then from the literature, from the extant literature, we know that uh, there are a lot of channels through which natural disasters in the form of hurricanes actually impact firms. So, uh, they can trigger uh, certain irrational management reactions. This is a paper in the Journal of Financial Economics that was published a couple of years ago. They can trigger cash flow shocks, uh, inefficient reallocations of capital. And um, a colleague of mine at Temple University has published a paper uh, more recently about credit constraints faced by firms in the wake of, of hurricane risks. So essentially, uh, we are experiencing this um, you know, increase in losses. And we know that through several channels, the risk can actually um, impact firms directly. So what is our idea? What is our contribution with the paper? The first thing is we introduce a theoretical framework um, based on a consumption-based asset pricing model, uh, a quite established model from Constantinidis and Duffy in 1996. I'll, um, I'll show you uh, where that leads uh, in a minute, but I'm not going to go into too much detail with the theory because I really want to spend more time presenting the empirical results. Uh, but the model that we developed uh, based on that uh, CCAPM approach uh, that we adopted from uh, Constantinidis and Duffy actually predicts the existence of such a hurricane risk premium in exactly the same time period in which, I'm just jumping back quickly, in which we have entered that you know, warm phase of the AMO. And then um, what we then do is we try to empirically find evidence for that hurricane risk premium in asset markets. Uh, and we do that by uh, using a large range or a large battery of empirical asset pricing tests. Uh, we do univariate out of sample portfolio sorts. We do Farmer Macbeth regressions. We do time series regressions and so forth. I'll show you all uh, the evidence uh, throughout the rest of this talk. What we find is um, a highly significant, robust and large hurricane risk premium. So we construct uh, a zero investment portfolio, what we call NMP, so negative minus uh, positive uh, sensitivity uh, of stocks with regard to hurricane risk. So um, once we do that, we can actually de um, determine uh, the size of that uh, difference in the return, in the actually excess return between stocks with a negative hurricane risk sensitivity and those stocks with a positive hurricane risk sensitivity. And that difference in the excess return amounts to at least 6.14% per annum. I'm saying at least because it depends on uh, which uh, established asset pricing models you then use to see how much alpha uh, is left on the table. Um, but you, can see, you will be able to see that in the different 
uh, empirical results that I show you that, you know, depending on what approach you use, it could be even larger than this. And uh, then uh, in the last part of the paper, we um, dig deeper into the economic mechanism. So we try to understand uh, what is driving the hurricane risk premium, in particular with regard to um, risk exposure. And we uh, create a term called economic hurricane risk exposure, which deviates from the geographic exposure, uh, because we say that, uh, you know, you can be impacted by direct losses. Obviously, you could have a production facility uh, in, a, in an area where the hurricane strikes and face direct uh, damages uh, or destruction of your facility, of your assets. But on the other hand, you could be somewhere completely else and you could be linked to the event through a supply chain or through a sales market or whatever. And when the hurricane strikes in that other area, you will still face the consequences despite the fact that the headquarters of your firm are based in a state, let's say on the other side of, uh, of the United States, for example, in California or in Washington, whatever. Um, hurricane risk over time, uh, that's what I mentioned already. We have the seasonal pattern that we want to uh, actually find also in the uh, excess return time series of our trading strategy or our theory investment portfolio. Uh, so if hurricane risk follows that seasonal pattern, we should see a similar pattern in, um, in this time series of returns um, because it should translate uh, you know, into the time series, given that we have um, found the right evidence. And then industry and market cap. So certain industry can be identified that would be impacted more than others by these types of events. And also we want to find out whether the effect really comes from uh, very small firms or more from larger firms. And I'll show you more on that um, towards the end of the talk. So um, are there any questions so far? No? Super clear. Perfect. <clears throat> and then, then let's move on. So um, in terms of the literature, where we positioning the paper is, and there is a literature on, on natural disasters in financial markets. And there's a lot of excellent work um, on that um, sort of topic, but not specifically with regard to asset pricing. So a lot of studies you will see in this stream of the literature are um, event studies. So people, for example, look at the reaction of stock prices of insurance companies um, after the occurrence of an earthquake or a hurricane, uh, things like that have, done, have been done quite a bit. Uh, but there's really only very few studies that look at the impact of um, extreme uh, disaster events on the mean of the return distribution of stocks, right? So, so the asset pricing aspect is, is really something that is new. Uh, there is a big literature on the economics of uh, natural disasters. Uh, that literature is also growing. Uh, they, these, these guys here have been looking at, for example, the impact of uh, hurricanes on local labor markets, on, uh, you know, on input markets and, uh, and so forth, um, but not on financial markets necessarily. There is a huge and, uh, and growing literature on climate finance, uh, and that's a quite a recent literature that particularly looks at the impact of CO2 emissions by firms on the difference of their cost of capital in the cross section. Uh, one of the you know, most prominent papers is probably um, this one. It has recently been published in, in the Journal of Financial Economics. Um, so we are related to that literature, um, but it's not directly the same thing that we're looking at because uh, the event that we're studying that will, you know, or the risk, let's say the, the event risk that we're studying that has an impact um, on uh, the returns of financial assets is actually driven by climate change or will be driven by climate change going forward. So this is why we think we have a link to this literature and the results that we present should be important uh, to that stream of the literature as well. And then the last uh, part of the literature that we're actually contrib contributing to is uh, that very famous strand of um, you know, publications in asset pricing, uh, particularly focusing on the impact of rare disasters. And you know, this, this, this is a, a very established literature, but what these guys have been looking at mainly 
are um, rare disasters um, in, you know, in, uh, from a per political perspective, such as wars, um, or then from an economic perspective, uh, major recessions, things like that, that can have an impact on, uh, on asset prices. Uh, in uh, one of the papers, this one by Jessica Wachter, she, she mentions that natural disasters could have the same effect, although, uh, you know, it has not been studied so far. And uh, at the time, you know, it was not conceivable that natural disasters could be strong enough to actually impact the, uh, the utility of a representative investor, which is most of these, um, you know, it's a theory most of these um, papers are using is a re representative investor um, consumption-based asset pricing models. But there is a link to this literature too, and we hope that we can enrich that strand um, with, with our results as well. So in terms of data, uh, what we use is, um, on the one hand, normalized economic losses for hurricanes, as I showed you in the chart a couple of slides ago. They have been published in a paper by Weinkley et al. Um, that is basically their work was to normalize these losses over that uh, you know, long period of time and to publish them so that other researchers could use them. Uh, we then use a pretty much a standard set of uh, stocks, stock returns from CRISP uh, in the time period between 1963 and 2020. That is also a standard time period that uh, you know, usually asset pricing studies look at. And then we pair that with a couple of additional data sets. Um, one is macroeconomic consumption data uh, and income data. We need that um, for the theoretical part. So what we do is we have that theory and I'll show you in a minute how it looks like. And then we do um, a first a preliminary empirical analysis of whether a necessary condition that we derive from the theory actually holds. And this is what, why we need that macroeconomic data on consumption and income. Uh, and then we move on to analyze the security prices. Last thing uh, is uh, data on financial statements uh, from the SEC EDGAR uh, database. Why do we need that? Because we want to do a, or we do a textual analysis uh, at the end where we say, we want to see whether firms mention hurricane losses or hurricane risk in their 10Ks. Uh, and we want to see whether the effect that we find with regard to the excess returns of those firms uh, differs by firms that mentioned hurricane losses with, versus firms that did not mention hurricane losses. Uh, and I'll get back to that uh, towards, uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay, so um, as I said, I only want to um, briefly describe the theory. I don't want to go into too much detail because it spans uh, quite a bit of the paper. Uh, and uh, I would like to refer you to the paper if, if you're interested in more, in more details, uh, particularly the mathematical derivations of the model. But uh, the, the basis for all that we do is uh, the famous heterogeneous agent model by Konstantinidis and Duffy. Uh, in, in that 1996 paper in the Journal of Political Economy. Uh, what we do is we, we call it, we derive a consumption inequality hypothesis. So uh, what Konstantinidis and Duffy have done is they basically extended the classical consumption-based model by, a, by the idea that um, apart from a correlation between consumption growth and the returns on risky assets, um, a second driver of risk premiums could be the correlation between uh, consumption inequality and the return on risky assets. And what you see here is already our extended version of uh, what Constantinidis and Duffy have done. So basically what they use, the main drivers in their model, so on the left side, this is the expected excess return on an asset, right? the expected excess return or the risk premium if you want. And what their model says is, they have one correlation instead of two here. We have two, I'll, show, um, I'll discuss it in a minute, but their main correlation is a correlation between uh, consumption growth and asset returns. And the second main correlation is one between consumption inequality and asset returns. And what we do is we basically break down these correlations to have two. One is a correlation between the macroeconomic fundamentals. So consumption growth and uh, and uh, income, uh, sorry, consumption inequality, which we measure by income inequality. 
and um, aggregate hurricane loss growth on the one hand side, and then the correlation between asset returns and aggregate hurricane loss growth on the other side. So what we want to do is we want to split the empirical um, verification of the model or the empirical evidence into two parts. Uh, first of all, we examine whether these correlations here exist. So the correlations between macroeconomic fundamentals such as consumption growth, and then on the other side, uh, aggregate hurricane loss growth. Um, and also the second one between consumption inequality and aggregate hurricane loss growth. Why? Because if they do, do not exist, if there is no macroeconomic link, if in other terms, if um, hurricane losses or hurricane loss growth is not uh, related to macroeconomic fundamentals in any shape or form, then this theory would not predict uh, a, a hurricane risk premium, right? So we need this macroeconomic link between aggregate hurricane loss growth and macroeconomic fundamentals first. And then we can turn to the security prices and the security returns, right? So when we do this, when we analyze this correlation here from an empirical perspective, turns out that uh, consumption growth and aggregate hurricane loss growth are not related in the period that we are particularly interested in, in that warm phase of the AMO, uh, right? That I showed on the previous slide, but uh, there is a relation between uh, consumption inequality and um, aggregate hurricane loss growth. So this model would therefore predict a risk premium, given that we also have these um, correlations here, and they will be measured through a, um, a security beta. Uh, so the beta of a security um, with regard to aggregate hurricane loss growth. Okay, so. Since we have a zero correlation here, we do not focus on this part of the model anymore. Our focus will be down here. And the question will be that we will answer with our main empirical analyses, whether um, securities or stocks in the time between 1995 and 2017 had a negative correlation or negative beta for that matter um, with aggregate hurricane loss growth and whether these securities then paid a risk premium, so whether their return, their excess return on average was higher over that period than the excess return on stocks that uh, you know, had a positive or a much smaller um, negative uh, correlation uh, with aggregate hurricane loss growth. Why do we need this to be negative? Well, and it's pretty simple from the model, we have this minus sign here. Uh, and this correlation would be expected to be positive. We also find it to be positive. So uh, if, uh, you know, what, what, can, what the investor here does not like, or the consumer, if you want, uh, the, the representative uh, consumer does not like, is if times of high consumption inequality coincide with, uh, you know, high hurricane loss growth. Over here, uh, up here, that would mean, you know, what you don't like is uh, if your consumption growth is low, and um, hurricane loss growth uh, would be higher. So here we have the we have this we expect this to be positive. We find it to be positive, and then we need a negative correlation between the returns on the assets and hur hurricane loss growth to actually get a positive risk premium. And this makes sense as well if you think about it. So if firms are negatively impacted, uh, you know, if hurricane loss growth is high then you would expect a negative return on average of, um, of those firms, right? So the correlation here, you would expect it to be negative um, as well. So, and the question is, can we actually find that using empirical analysis? Now, just to document this a little bit more um, to show that over time. So we're doing a rolling, on this slide, we're doing a 10 year rolling correlation between consumption inequality and aggregate hurricane loss growth. Uh, and you can see that, uh, interestingly, uh, the pattern is quite similar to what we saw from the AMO. So this is also a smooth series, but you can see that the correlation that we're interested in given our theory actually turns into uh, you know, the positive territory uh, around the mid 1990s. So exactly the, su the same time period in which we know that the surface temperatures have increased and we also know that the economic losses caused by hurricanes have increased. And now we see that 
the correlation between consumption inequality and aggregate hurricane loss growth has increased as well. So we, what we say then is, given that it makes sense to dig further um, and start analyzing security returns, if we were not able to find a correlation like this, then our theory would not predict the hurricane risk premium at all. And then, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense from our perspective to actually analyze the security returns. Can, Alex, yeah. can we go back to that plot? I just want to look more, is this monthly data? Uh, this is annual, actually. This is annual. annual data. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a funny dot right around 2000 and this seven. one. Yeah. 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 What's up with question. that? I have, to be honest, I can't tell you uh, off the bat. So I would, uh, I would need to look into the data set. What's, uh, uh -huh. what's going on with this one? Uh, it's yeah, it's a strange drop, and then it goes back up again. Um, it's a little noisy around this dot, so I don't, I don't know what this, what this is. So, but you, your correlations are based on ten data points. Yeah. Then. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank so you. it's uh, yeah, fair, uh, fair point. So um, it is not, um, it is not a particularly sort of let's say big data set that we have to analyze this. But uh, the problem is that a hurricane loss growth is on an annual time frame, So we only have an annual time series. So this is the, this is the best we can do um, basically Got it. with the macroeconomic data. Understood, thank you. Okay, so, but given that, so what we say is uh, given the theory, let's go back here, given the theory and uh, you know, an empirical, I wouldn't say necessarily evidence, but indication uh, that is, uh, you know, that we find a correlation here, we can expect an, a hurricane risk premium given a negative beta or negative correlation there. And, and this is what we do in the rest of the paper. And this is what I would like to spend uh, the, you know, the rest of the time basically uh, trying to um, discuss that. So one problem that we have, and this is what you just mentioned, Lisa, is that our macroeconomic data is on an annual frequency. Uh, and we would like to do the asset pricing analysis on a monthly frequency. So what you do uh, and what people typically use in the finance literature to tackle that problem is uh, a so-called mimicking portfolio. So you take a set of base assets. In our case, that's the 25 uh, Pharma French uh, portfolio sorted on size and book to market. And then you take your risk factor, in this case, our aggregate hurricane loss growth uh, figure, and you project that risk factor into the asset space, the excess return space. Uh, and we do that at an annual frequency. So essentially, it's, uh, it's nothing else than regressing that um, macroeconomic magnitude uh, on basically the base assets to find uh, what we call weights. And then we normalize these weights so that they sum to one some to 100%, and then we apply these weights to the base assets at the monthly frequency. And what that gives us is a monthly time series of excess returns on the so-called mimicking portfolio. A mimicking portfolio um, basically is called a mimicking portfolio because it, mimic, it mimics the behavior of the actual factor um, over time but it does so at a higher frequency, right? It, it, it does it at a monthly frequency instead of an annual frequency. Uh, and then if you look at the correlation between the annual series uh, aggregate hurricane loss growth and the annual series of the, uh, the mimicking portfolio that we can also create to cal calculate that correlation between the two, we get a figure of 0.76, which is quite high compared to the, ex the, the extant literature. So most papers find lower correlations between the mimicking portfolio and the actual risk factor, and they still go for it. So we think that we're um, we're doing all right here with a correlation of 0.76. Uh, that is to say, the mimicking portfolio uh, does a decent job at capturing the uh, behavior of the actual macroeconomic risk factor uh, over time. And then going forward, what we do is we work with the, uh, the, the excess return time series of that mimicking portfolio on a monthly basis. Uh, specifically, we create that hurricane risk beta by doing a 60 month rolling regression before each. So in each month, we want to do a sorting. This, this is what I show here. In each month, 
we want to sort the cross-section of stocks according to their hurricane risk sensitivity. And hurricane risk sensitivity is measured by the beta of each stock um, with regard to the mimicking portfolio that we just created. So basically with regard to the mimicking portfolio of the actual risk factor, which is the hurricane, uh, the aggregate hurricane loss growth, right? Which we also had in, uh, in our uh, theory. So remember that the correlation in our theor theory was the correlation between the excess returns on the assets and aggregate hurricane loss growth. And what we're measuring here empirically is Inside the beta is a correlation between the excess returns on the assets uh, and the mimicking portfolio of aggregate hurricane loss growth, right? Which, although is highly correlated with uh, the underlying factor. So every month um, in, in those time periods, uh, we basically sort all stocks that we have in the data set according to their hurricane risk beta. And the hurricane risk beta is calculated uh, by taking the 60 month returns um, prior to the sorting date. Uh, and regressing those basically on uh, the mimicking portfolio to get the beta of the stock with regard to the, uh, the hurricane risk factor. And then we can sort according to those betas, we sort into quintile portfolios. So you can see in portfolio one, we have the stocks that have on average the, the highest negative hurricane risk beta. And in portfolio five, we have the stocks that have on average the highest positive hurricane risk beta. Uh, that is to say, we have stocks that um, ha exhibit returns that positively react to hurricane loss growth and some that negatively react. And that also makes sense because different industries and different firms would be affected differently. So you could benefit, for example, you could be in this class here. So hurricane loss growth is high, but your return is also positive. Uh, why? Because you might be in the construction industry uh, and may maybe get, uh, you know, a benefit from being able to uh, rebuild uh, and, and basically earn, um, earn um, you know, uh, turnover there. Uh, or you could, be in, you could be positively impacted because a competitor is going out of business uh, for a certain period of time due to the hurricane and you could take advantage of that. But what we also can see is the majority of firms are actually negatively impacted and you would expect that um, as well. And what we then do is we form a, the, the zero investment portfolio. That's the difference between the negatively, most negatively and the, and the positively impacted firms. Uh, and then we calculate the average excess return of, those, uh, of this zero investment portfolio. And we do that for the time period 1986 to uh, 1994. And for the time period after 95 to 2020, which is the one that I showed you where we're in the warm phase of the AMO, we have much higher uh, economic losses. Uh, we also find the necessary condition for our theory in this period. So if we were to expect a hurricane risk premium in the asset markets, then we would expect it in this period and not before, because before that we did not have all the prerequisites um, that, that I discussed on the previous slides. And interestingly, if you look at the you know, average excess return of the difference portfolio, then you have a highly significant uh, excess return here for that time period where we find all the prerequisites. We do not have a, a significant excess return for the time period before where we don't, do not find the prerequisites. So, uh, so that is what we'd say first evidence for a hurricane risk premium uh, since 1995. But obviously this is univariate. So uh, what we need to do is uh, basically, uh, you know, conduct further multivariate evidence and see whether uh, we can confirm the existence of the premium uh, with that. Uh, before I jump to the next slide, maybe just a quick question whether, um, you know, anyone has any, un you know, unclear points or any questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, I guess I'll go on. So what we then do is uh, we just, um, you know, to visualize the evolution of that risk premium over time is we take, I'm just jumping back here, this NMP that you can see here, right? This is a monthly time series of excess returns. So what we can do is we take that monthly time series of excess returns of the negative minus, minus positive hard insensitive stocks 
regress it on a pharma French three factor as a pricing model and see what uh, happens with the alpha, right? Do we have an alpha left? Do we have a positive alpha left? Uh, and we can do that uh, on a rolling basis to get a picture of how the alpha of this uh, basically trading strategy or this asset for this zero investment portfolio, whatever you want to call it, uh, how that alpha has evolved over time. Uh, so we're doing that here. Um, and I've plotted it together with a 10 year rolling correlation uh, that you've seen in the previous chart, you know, between macroeconomic fundamentals and ag aggregate hurricane loss growth. And here the interesting part is that the uh, pharma French three factor alpha, so the alpha that the pharma French three factor model cannot explain, or the, the unexplained return left by this model, given you, ex and you basically execute a trading strategy that um, uh, we did. Um, is basically turning positive in the same time period uh, that we've seen the other sort of uh, charts turn positive before. I think, Lisa, you have a question, right? You raised your hand in the... Oh, no, okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is interesting, right? We're seeing this uh, risk premium, if you want, emerge in the very same time period that we find the correlation that we need for the theory, that we have the AMO turn positive, that we have much higher economic losses uh, from hurricanes. Now, one could say, okay, um, you're using this mimicking portfolio, and, and that's a little bit of an Achilles heel because we have the macroeconomic factor aggregate hurricane loss growth, and that's only available at annual frequency. And so uh, doing this long-term analysis, um, you know, with the sorting, you can't do that on a monthly frequency. Uh, and so maybe uh, all of the results um, have to do with the fact that you're using uh, a mimicking portfolio. So what we're then doing in the paper is we try to compensate that through an excessive battery of robustness checks with other measures for hurricane risk. And I'm not showing all of them. So we, we have done it with uh, EMDAT uh, hurricane loss data. We're currently working on uh, using NOAA data and Shelter's data as well. Uh, but the probably most interesting robustness check is we use the excess return time series on the Swiss free US wind cap on index. So those are all outstanding single peril US wind catastrophe bonds that are essentially securitizations of hurricane risk. So if we use that as a measure for hurricane risk, we do not need the mimicking portfolio because these returns are available on a monthly basis. Uh, and we can use this to create the hurricane risk beta, uh, sort of not uh, with regard to the mimicking portfolio, but directly with regard to this as a risk factor. So what we do is we calculate the betas or we, we estimate the betas by doing the 60 month rolling regressions as we do for the mimicking portfolio as well. But in this case, we do the 60 month rolling regressions by regressing uh, each stock return on the excess return time series of the Swiss Re cap bond index. So we do not need a mimicking portfolio in this regard. And then we do the sorting again. And now it becomes interesting. And I wanna draw your attention to the fact that in this case, we need to do the opposite, not one minus five, but five minus one. Uh, why? Because in this case, uh, the, 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 the stocks with the negative beta uh, are actually the ones that are positively correlated with um, the hurricane loss growth. So the Swiss Re Cat Bond Index should exhibit a negative return when hurricane loss growth is high, right? So essentially those stocks that exhibit a negative return when hurricane loss growth is high, it should be the ones positively correlated. So the ones in portfolio five, the ones positively correlated with the Swiss Re index. And interestingly, if you do that, you also get a significant um, hurricane risk premium um, as we found uh, on, the on the previous slide here, uh, but we're now using a, a measure for that latent risk factor, right? So hurricane risk itself is a latent factor. We can only find, uh, you know, we'll try to find empirical measures for it. Uh, using aggregate hurricane loss growth data from Winkley et al. was one way to do it. Using Shelter's data would be another one. Using NOAA data on losses would be another one. And here we're using directly 
the reaction of the, the cap bond market uh, in terms of um, wind, wind related cap bonds. Um, and we can actually see the same effect. So I've got so, a question about the, uh, yeah. this index. So it's labeled wind and obviously hurricanes have wind. Their strength is characterized by their wind speeds. Um, yeah. a, a lot of the damages are from um, uh, storm surge and um, yeah, and flooding, which are obviously geographically related to being on the coast as yeah. opposed to uh, slightly inland. So uh, to what extent is this really an index of hurricane losses as opposed to uh, a particular aspect of hurricane yeah. losses? Yeah, so that's a very good question um, because uh, these cat bonds usually exclude flood-related losses from hurricanes. So st storm surge and things like that are not securitized into the cat bonds. Um, so, uh, but the fact that they still react negatively when the hurricane uh, occurs means that they, they still capture to a certain extent the risk profile that we're looking for. But they cannot, what they don't capture is really the, um, you know, the flood losses that are triggered by a certain hurricane. So we do have a mismatch there, uh, that, that is true. Um, but what we would say is, um, you know, it's important to consider um, a, a broad battery of different measures for hurricane risk. One of this could be uh, the, the Swiss Re Cat Bond Index, which has absolutely, uh, as you correctly point out, has uh, the disadvantage of not capturing uh, flood related hurricane losses but it has the advantage of being av available on a monthly basis and uh, being available without you know, having to first project hurricane loss growth, which is a, you know, an, a non-financial factor into the excess return space. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so I, it comes with disadvantages, but it has, has other advantages. Yeah. But a very good question. Hi, I have a question too. Um, hello, um, I'm from... I'm from Thailand. Uh, wow. Thanks for opportunity for me to attend the seminar too. Um, did you try? Did you try the um, Q factor model and and the Pharma French uh, six factor models for yeah. the alphas? Yeah. So uh, perfect question uh, and also perfect timing for the question because I was just about to jump to this slide. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, where <laughs> Uh, and, and, and yeah, so what you're correctly pointing out is uh, at this point, right? Um, so I'm just going back here quickly. At this point, what we found here, so this is the average of the excess return time series of the zero investment portfolio that we constructed, right? And also on, on this slide here, this is the average of that time series. Now, what tells us that we just, you know, we could have just dug up an, a factor that is already uh, researched, that is already published, that other people have already discovered. So what tells us that this is you know, not related to anything we know from in terms of systematic risk fa factors? And uh, th that's why your question is absolutely uh, you know, important and highly relevant at this point. We need to make sure that our NMP excess return time series uh, withstands uh, you know, a test with regard to all, you know, at least, um, um, you know, a broad range of established systematic risk factors, uh, which is what you were just um, basically pointing out in your, question, uh, in your question. What we need to do is we need to regress this NMP time series on the time series of established factor models and see whether we are left with a significant alpha in the end, right? Because what would happen if all the variation that we have in this excess return time series here was known variation that is attributable to existing risk factors, then after regressing NMP on, let's say, the Pharma French uh, three-factor model or Pharma French three-factor plus momentum factor or the, the new Pharma French five-factor model, right, with RMW and CMA, then we should not find a significant alpha. Uh, it should all be, you know, all the variation should be explained by these established risk factors. So what we're doing in this table is basically trying to test this time series against every other factor under the sun. Uh, and the important, basically the important line is this one, and also uh, the one with the adjusted R squared down here. 
So these are the different models that we use uh, to basically see whether NMP withstands, uh, the, you know, the, the factors that are included in those models. And interestingly, you can see here, no matter what type of established factor model we use, we are always left with a significant alpha of the NMT, uh, NMP time series, meaning that the established risk factors cannot explain the variation that we find in, or that we have embedded in this new NMP excess return time series. Uh, it is left as an abnormal return, as an alpha return by these models. Uh, and the adjusted R squared is interesting to look at as well because uh, some models are really very low. So if you take the, you know, the four factor um, Pharma French three plus momentum, uh, it's, you know, below 10% explained a variation, very low. Some go up to 25%, but, uh, you know, overall you can see that these models do not explain a high degree of variation of the factor uh, that we have here in, in, in the NMP uh, time series, uh, which leads us to conclude that um, whatever we find here, it is not something that is embedded in any other risk factor uh, that has been uh, basically looked at before. The next test we want to pass is um, the, the question whether firm characteristics in the cross section uh, can actually, uh, you know, explain or soak up the effect that we have from our hurricane risk beta. So, what we would like to see in this pharma, so-called pharma Macbeth regression. So, for those of you who are not not necessarily highly familiar with it, what you do in the pharma Macbeth regression is essentially in every month uh, we have the whole cross section of stocks. And we regress the next month, so one month ahead, so the future return, on the firm specific characteristics um, of the cross section. So essentially, you do a, a series of cross sectional regressions, one in every month, where you regress the next month return on this month's uh, cross sectional firm characteristics. Why? Because we know from the literature that some firm characteristics, for example, size or idiosyncratic volatility, co skewness and so forth, are to a certain extent predictors of next month's return. And we, what we are claiming in, in, you know, in our asset pricing tests is that our hurricane risk beta, uh, as I mentioned, uh, that we constructed using the mimicking portfolio and so forth, we claim essentially that the hurricane risk beta is also a predictor of next month's return. Now, what we want to see is that uh, we still have a significant impact or significant correlation, if you want, of the hurricane risk beta with next month's return, even if we add all the established uh, or known firm characteristics that are also uh, exhibiting an impact on next month's return. So the interesting um, line in this table is actually the top line here. We start to add further firm characteristics as we go to the right. And we want to see that the, the effect of the beta uh, on next month's return remains significant. Because if by adding these firm specific characteristics, uh, this would go away, we would basically need to conclude that the, you know, the variation that we have in our new factor is basically already explained by a difference in firm characteristics cross-sectional difference in firm characteristics, which we know to impact next month's return. But as you can see, uh, this is not the case, right? So the beta, our hurricane risk beta, which is the basis for our sortings as well, right? We were sorting by this beta as well, sorting stocks with a high negative uh, and uh, a positive beta in the different portfolios. Uh, so this remains significant um, as we go along and add uh, you know, the firm specific characteristics that explain future returns. So uh, from this anal analysis, we can conclude that uh, firm characteristics are not driving the effect. So we're not digging up something that is already known and is attributable to size or idiosyncratic volatility or anything like that. Then the next empirical test we want to pass is if this is a relevant factor, then by adding it to an established factor model, it should actually increase um, the fit or decrease the, you know, the error, if you want. So what we are plotting here, and that's quite common in the asset pricing literature, is we plot 
the fitted expected excess returns against the um, mean of the realized excess return. Uh, so fitted means, uh, you know, basically the, the, the return predicted by the asset pricing model. In this case, the asset pricing model is just the classical pharma French three factor plus momentum. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we would like to see ideally is along this 45 degree line, you can see the dashed line here, we would like to basically see all the test portfolios, which in this case are the 25 uh, pharma French portfolios that we use as test assets. We would like to uh, then see them aligned along the 45 degree line, because in this case, the, you know, the average realized return would be nicely predicted by, um, uh, so sort of would be very close to the, the fitted uh, return. If you have deviations from the 45 degree line, then the realized return is, is either larger or smaller uh, than what is predicted by the model. And you can see that the classical uh, pharma French three factor model uh, basically leads to an RMSE, a root mean squared error of 0 0.23 uh, or 0 0.24 if you want. And now the question is what happens if we add our NMP factor to this established model, right? Does that do anything to the, you know, the cross section, the fit to the cross section of expected excess returns? And as you can see, just visually, um, you know, this bunch, you know, is, is basically a little bit better distributed along the 45 degree line and the RMSE goes down. Admittedly, it's not a huge improvement, but uh, you know, it's, it's, to be honest, it's very challenging to find factors uh, that still improve what we have from the established literature. So I think this is, all, this is already worth mentioning uh, because usually uh, you will only be able to decrease this by very little because we know that this model is, uh, and this is why it has stood the test of time so well. It is one of the few models that performs and has performed consistently uh, you know, over many, many years and decades now, um, and it's hard to beat, right? So um, we're actually con I'm confident that this is a good sign uh, that adding our, you know, NMP zero investment portfolio or trading strategy to this model uh, improves the fit, if only slightly. Okay, so um, th I think this would be a good point uh, to just quickly pause and see whether we have any further questions. Oh, so you uh, want to mention yeah. this before, but did you look at you any? Know, did you look at any other uh, indices like this, or just at the, just the wind? Uh, you mean the cat bond index? Yeah. Um, just the wind one, uh, because we need a single parallel, um, a single parallel index. Uh, if the time series of excess returns would be contaminated by, uh, let's say, earthquake risk or uh, some, some other type of natural disaster risk, and it would probably add too much noise. So we could do that, but we thought that the best way to tackle it is to take the purest measure of uh, hurricane risk that is available in, uh, in the cat bond uh, market, and that is the single peril wind risk um, uh, index. But you know, related to Robert's question from before, what we could do is um, I, in another project that I'm working on, I have access to a large data set of uh, price data on cat bonds. So what we could do is actually take that secondary market price data set of cat bonds and try to filter out the ones that are really, uh, you know, just including hurricane risk, no tornado risk, nothing else, and create an even, you know, uh, more specific measure of hurricane risk. I'm not sure whether it would improve anything because um, I think the, the important part is that we don't have the flood risk included in this in this hurricane index. Um, but I think there is nothing we can do about that. There are only two or three flood um, risk cap bond transactions out there, uh, which have been issued by the NFIP over the last three or four years. Um, what we could do is try to add them to a custom index and see whether that, um, that actually adds a little bit of, um, of value to the analysis, but uh, yeah. So for the time being, we thought it would be a good way to just stick with the purest measure that we have in the capital markets, and that's the single parallel index. Does that answer your question, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. No, I just I find this very interesting. I mean, yeah, as you know, earth earthquake and the other hazards are not correlated, so you could 
separate that out potentially, but it, you know, I just yeah, I like right. I, I like the the path you're going because I, I just don't think a lot of people have looked at this data. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So so I think you know if we were using the the Swiss remain cap on index, the global cap on index, which also comprises earthquake risk and other things, we could, I think that's your point, right? We could orthogonalize the time series, uh, regressing it on, uh, you know, we could try to strip out the variation that is caused by, by earthquake bonds to, to be left with only the, the variation that is, that is, that is caused by. Yeah. Risk. Yeah. yeah that, that would be the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Um, can I have now that in one the last quick part, question? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I construct a bunch of, uh, in, in my other work too, I construct a portfolio related to insurance companies. And mm -hmm. um, I try to use a similar way that you are doing, like the Pharma French six factor and also the Q factor models, try to yeah. explain this kind of portfolio. And this seems to uh, be like underperformed. Uh, and they can really explain it. So do you have um, your NMP available online? Maybe I can <laughs> <laughs> try to use that to explain I, my, yeah. I can send it to you. So, so the paper is, um, is, is not published yet. We're approaching a period where, um, you know, a phase, I would say a stage where we are getting ready for submission. Um, so, and since it's not published yet, the factor is not available online yet, but I can, I can send it to you. So if you just send me an email after the seminar, um, right. I'll send it to you probably not tonight because it uh, will be getting <laughs> late right. later on, but, uh, but tomorrow. Okay. So um, I can, I can give you the, the excess return time series of the NMP factor, um, you know, starting in 1995, all the way through 2020. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so so in the last part of the of the paper, what we do is we look at the economic mechanism, and uh, you know uh, these are the four things that we consider. One is uh, the question of is really geographic exposure what we find, or is there something like an economic exposure? I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Then we want to find that seasonality pattern that we know from the hurricane risk. If we are if this NMP is really capturing uh, you know, uh, the, the, let's say the risk premium of hurricane risk over time, uh, we would expect to see like a similar behavior, uh, you know, as we know from how risk, how hurricane risk unfolds throughout the year. And then we want to see, you know, whether, uh, you know, the, the industry you are in has an impact on whether, uh, you know, you are affected by the risk premium and also the market cap of the firm. So for the geographic versus economic exposure, what we do is, uh, it's actually pretty simple. So we take all the 10Ks uh, and other financial reports from the, Ad, the SEC Edgar database. And then uh, unfortunately, this is only available for 2000 to 2017. Um, we take uh, these uh, reports, we analyze them for the keyword hurricane loss, and then we split the sample into two uh, we have one part of the sample. Those are all the firms, uh, basically, that mention the hurricane loss. Uh, and we look at the, uh, at, the, at the firms with headquarters in states where firms mentioned hurricane loss. And then we have firms with headquarters in states where no one mentioned the hurricane loss uh, over that time period, over that overall time period. So it, it's enough if you mention hurricane loss once in that time period, then you basically assign to the subsample of headquarters of firms in states uh, where hurricane losses occurred. And um, so this is the interesting part. We then do the sorting again for those two subsamples, those that you know, are headquartered in states where a firm mentioned the hurricane loss and those that are headquartered in states where a firm did not mention the hurricane loss. Uh, and as you can see here, the, uh, the effect is there for those uh, states where firms mentioned hurricane loss and it's not there uh, for the rest. And so um, we take that as an indication that, um, you know, for two things, one, uh, you know, we, we, you would actually expect the effect to be driven by those states in which firms face the hurricane loss. And the second thing is that geographic exposure is not the same as economic exposure. 
So uh, on this slide, on the left-hand side, you see uh, just a historical, this is published by NOAA, uh, historical hurricane landfalls between 1815 and 2012. And obviously you would expect to see these states you know, along the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. Uh, and what we find is we find a lot of, you know, our analysis, this is the econ economic hurricane exposure map, if you want. So those are the states uh, that basically um, are included in this sample here on the left hand side that that basically create the hurricane risk premium. We find a lot of those states uh, that are also included in the historical analysis, but we find a lot more states, um, particularly California and some other states here. Um, on, on the West Coast, uh, like Washington, Oregon, that are not directly threatened by hurricane risk. Uh, but the idea is that these states are linked to what happens in other states through economic activity, through supply chains, uh, and things like that. And um, this is why, based on what we do here, and you can actually do that, you can look at the financial reports and see what they say. And some of the firms are really headquartered in California and say, look, um, we had this problem because the hurricane impacted one of our uh, facilities uh, on the East Coast. And so a part could not be delivered and we had the supply chain issue and so forth. You also find a lot of energy firms, obviously, um, that are impacted because of the you know, um, situation in the, in the Gulf of Mexico and so forth. So there are economic links. Uh, this is what we say in the paper that basically um, expose firms in the states other than the Gulf and East Coast states to hurricane risk. Then we do the seasonality an analysis or we want to see whether we see a seasonal pattern first visually. So on the left-hand side, you see the average quarterly return. So we take the NMP series, we turn it into a quarterly return series, and then we calculate the average re return over all quarters. Um, um, so average return over all first quarters or second quarters or third quarters or fourth quarters. And then you, what you see is, and, and this, by the way, this year, this is the profile, um, the hurricane um, occurrence frequency that we have from AIR worldwide from that risk modeling firm. This is um, basically how hurricane risk is distributed over the, the four quarters with the peak of the hurricane season be being in the third quarter. And interestingly, around the peak of the hurricane season, our NMP factor delivers the lowest average return. So the, the, the third quarter return on average is the lowest of all four quarters. Uh, so we have an inverse relationship uh, here to, um, to the hurricane, hurricane risk distribution over, um, over the year. We run a periodogram um, which is basically a way to assess the, the frequency and magnitude of cyclical patterns in your time series data. And we get this massive spike at about, uh, you know, period 3.6 measured in quarters. Period 3.6 is exactly the middle of the third quarter, um, which is basically the absolute peak of the hurricanes, um, uh, hurricane season. I think it's, um, you know, um, August, September. Uh, so that is already some visual evidence. Um, we also have an ACF and a PACF chart in the paper that I, in the interest of time, I'm not showing here, uh, but they lead us to uh, design a, a, a seasonal ARIMA model that I would like to show you on the next slide. Um, we do um, a statistical analysis in two ways. We do a time series regression, basically trying to confirm this, what you see here visually from a statistical perspective, adding year fixed effects, right? We want to control uh, for, um, for the, the impact of different years. We basically neutralize the impact of the year. We only want to see with quarterly dummies, uh, what, you know, how much of the return variation in the quarterly excess return time series of NMP is explained by the, the quarter dummies. And you can see, so the base category is um, quarter one, which is why you not see it here. Uh, and then we have a dummy for quarter two, three, and four. And you can see that the third quarter dummy uh, exhibits a significant negative uh, coefficient. So that means uh, compared to the first quarter, which you see here, the third quarter is significantly lower. The return is significantly lower, even if you control for uh, year fixed effects. 
we develop a seasonal ARIMA model where we would like to find a seasonal AR1 coefficient, so an autocorrelation. We want to see the return to be correlated with itself. Uh, and we want to see it to be correlated with itself over four quarters. So the third quarter next year should be correlated with the third quarter this year, the fourth quarter next year with the fourth quarter this year and so forth. So if we see a significant coefficient on this seasonal AR1 term, that would confirm the hypothesis that we have that you know it's, a, it's an autocorrelation from quarter to quarter. Uh, and this is what we find here. So we have a significant um, coefficient on the seasonal AR1. The other coefficients here, the MA1 uh, and 2, this is basically a filter. I have to say this, we, we smooth the time series before we, run, before we run this ARIMA model. So the MA1 and 2 only pick up the filter, which is why they are highly significant. So this is something that is basically by construction. Uh, we have the normal AR1, but the particularly important part is we have a seasonal AR1 that is significant. And um, it's basically at the period that we would expect it to be um, from quarter to quarter. So Q3, uh, which is the peak of the hurricane season, seems to play a particularly important role in this NMP time series. Or in other words, the cyclical pattern of NMP over time basically matches what we know from the hurricane season. And if you think back how we constructed NMP, it cannot be in any shape or form imposed on NMP because NMP is really uh, the, the sorting uh, of the portfolios. And then we take the portfolio with the highest uh, negative hurricane beta minus the one with the positive uh, hurricane beta and the sorting and the betas, they have been constructed based on, our, uh, on aggregate hurricane loss curve. So we did not in any shape or form um, you know, introduce any seasonal variation artificially into this NMP time series, but we're finding it nevertheless, right? When we analyze it for, for seasonal patterns. Um, then second last analysis is hurricane risk across industries. So to make this more plausible, we would like to see this um, effect in particular industries and um, in the interest of time, I'm going a little bit faster there. We analyzed 10 uh, SIC divisions, so industry divisions and broader uh, sort of uh, pools of, of, of um, different sub-industries. Uh, and we find four out of those 10 to exhibit the effect, six do not uh, exhibit the effect. And the four that have the effect are service, manufacturing, and the two that I show here on the slide, finance, insurance, and real estate, and construction. So construction is really one that is particularly often cited in the literature when it comes to hurricane risk um, because of the you know, a, a demand surge effect after the disaster, because of you know, construction firms uh, benefiting potentially or uh, things like that. And then here, insurance and real estate are two industries that are also plausible from our perspective when it comes to hurricane risk. Uh, because insurers obviously and reinsurers um, are particularly exposed um, through the insurance policies that they write uh, as far as the risk is insured. So there is a correlation between insured losses and economic losses, although we have the protection gap. So insured losses are much lower than economic losses. Nevertheless, they are correlated. So if economic losses are very high, insurers will suffer higher losses as well. Uh, and real estate, obviously, what we're talking about is the destruction of uh, property, right? So the hurricane floods or destructs the property in any other uh, form. So the real estate industry should be impacted by hurricane risk as well, uh, which is why we think that finding the effect for these two and also manufacturing, uh, which um, is, you know, related through supply chain risk and, and, and service, and services can only be, uh, you know, basically uh, created on site. And if a hurricane hits certain areas, then that will disrupt the service industry in those areas because, you know, service firms will not be able to deliver their services for a certain period of time. So we think that the industry divisions that basically show the effect make sense from a fundamental economic standpoint. This is the last slide, um, and then I, I hope we still have a couple of minutes for, for questions in case you have some. 
Uh, we also do an, an analysis for um, the size of the firm. So how does the size of the firm in terms of market capitalization, how is that related to the hurricane risk premium? And we do that by double sorting. So first of all, we sort the firms in each month by market cap. And then in a second step, inside each of the market cap quintiles, we sort the firms according to hurricane risk beta, right? So that gives us uh, you know, a separate view on how the hurricane risk beta plays out in each size, size quintile, in each market cap quintile for the firms. And uh, we do that with, uh, without a winsorization. So this is a full sample. And then we, um, you know, we also winsorize the sample, meaning we exclude the, uh, the, the lowest 1% and the highest 5% market capitalizations from the sample and do the sorting again. But in both cases, you can see that the effect comes from the three larger size quintiles and not from the bottom uh, two size, size quintiles. And that's interesting because if you think of it, there could be an argument that smaller firms um, you know, are probably not uh, as resilient against this type of risk and should not be able to withstand it that much. But there's also the argument that smaller firms are much less interlinked with uh, you know, the supply chain argument with the rest of the economy. Uh, and so uh, you know, a, a hurricane that materializes and causes economic losses in certain areas will not necessarily cause ripples through the economy that will reach the smaller and smallest firms, but it will reach firms that are more closely interlinked. And those are typically, there's also work out there, empirical work that shows that, that those are typically the larger firms that are more interwoven with the rest of the economy. So th uh, that, Alex, that's basically, yeah. Yeah, I'm also, um, you're using the full CRSP data set, right? Not just, yeah. Uh, and so there's also issues of liquidity uh, associated oh, with prices yeah. and sp smaller firms, I think the data are just less reliable. That's a good point, actually. Um, so thanks, thanks for that input. We haven't thought about that, but that, that's, uh, that's a good point. So the data might be much more noisy there because they are less, less frequently traded um, and less liquid, right? The stocks so, are less liquid. Inevitably so. And so when you look at results like people like these anomalies, you know, the value anomaly or the beta yeah. anomaly. A lot of times, if you run this thing on a, a large data set, you see it. And then when you break it down, it actually shows up on the small firms uh -huh. and uh -huh. disappears out of the large ones. So your, your thing uh -huh. seems to be going in the opposite direction, uh, yeah, not what I'm used to. But uh, I mean, when, when I see the, the kind of analysis I just mentioned, I'm thinking, well, okay, it's nice. It's in data or something, but no yeah. one can make money on it, but he, he, this is kind of different. So it's interesting. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, given what you just said, I think it's, it's, this is a really interesting point because the fact that we find the effect for the larger size quintiles actually mm -hmm. uh, could be illustrating that it is not an anomaly in the sense that the market is not efficient. Uh, it, it, it is more of an evidence for the fact that the market might be quite efficient and actually pricing this type of risk uh, efficiently into uh, you know, into into the stock returns of those larger firms. So um, I think we'll have to think about that a little more. So this is one of the most recent analyses that we did, and we probably haven't sort of gotten to the bottom of it there, but um, I think your input is really valuable. So thanks for that. It's really good. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, so that's basically where I come to the conclusion slide. Um, so what we hope to show with the paper is that hurricane risk has been a systematic risk factor in the stock market since 1995. We have the theory um, and you know, I would love to have more time to dig deeper in the theory, but uh, it's a little bit of a paper for itself. And then we have the evidence for that hurricane risk premium. In terms of implications, it's really a new uh, transmission channel uh, where we see extreme weather risk unfold and basically impacting the global economy, or in this case, uh, the, the national US economy. Uh, and um, we think it's an interesting and novel finding because all of a sudden, natural disaster risks are no longer independent from financial risk. 
Now, if you're working in the insurance and reinsurance industry, you would say that we know that anyway. <laughs> but if you are sort of in a pure financial market context, people might think that, you know, these types of risks are fully diversifiable. So for me, I'm, 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 I have, uh, you know, back in the day, I worked in uh, capital markets. Now I have more of an insurance background. If I talk to finance scholars, they would say, why are you analyzing natural disaster risk? It's completely diversifiable. And we might have an, you know, we might have a point there that natural disaster risk all of a sudden is not necessarily completely diversifiable uh, anymore, uh, much less so if you think about the future. So um, just jumping on the last point quickly, uh, if you think about how climate change is forcing the temperatures higher, and then that surface temperature thing with the AMO is not going to go away. It's going to be, it's going to become worse, right? So all of the scientific indices um, point to the fact that a hurricane activity is going to become more intensive over the next uh, decade or so. So it will be very interesting to revisit this effect uh, further down the line and see whether it has been robust and whether it has actually intensified. And given it is there, what we think is, uh, it will have or should probably have uh, an impact on firm firm's business decision because what you know another way to look at the results here is um, you know we're, we're describing the paper in terms of an asset pricing perspective but you could also take or adopt the cost of capital perspective you could say what we're essentially finding is that in the cross-section of firms those firms that have a higher sensitivity to hurricane risk they have a higher cost of equity and, and um, we also know that they have a higher cost of insurance because insurance is much more expensive if you're more exposed to the risk. So this could have an impact on future business decisions because all of a sudden you might need to think about where to place your factories, your facilities, and to basically be sure that you're not too much exposed to direct risks, but also how your supply chain linkages um, basically expose you uh, to economic hurricane risk, as we say in the paper, and how that could impact your cost of equity uh, going forward as a firm. Because essentially what we're saying is that firms with high hurricane risk exposure pay 6% more per annum on average in terms of cost of equity than firms with a low hurricane risk exposure or low sensitivity. And that's basically, that's it. Uh, that's the... That's the, you know, the, the wrap up of the paper. And uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, be happy to answer them. A Alex, thank you for a really beautiful talk. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? It's all quiet. Yeah, well, it's what happens when it's kind of clear and so easily <laughs> laid out. I. Um, I, oh, no, this is great. Uh, I no, I love this. So, so Alex, we can, you said we can get access to this if we just email you. Uh, that's right. I can send you the, um, the, the time series of the NMP factor, and I can also send you uh, the, the current working paper version, which is um, not uh, published on SSRN or any database yet. So the, the working paper is not on the web yet because we're still polishing it, but I can send you the current version if you're interested. And I can also send you the NMP time series. Yeah, no, I'd be quite interested. And in fact, I may just set up a follow-up call with you. I have, I have some more detailed questions, but yeah. we'll do that another time. Perfect, yeah, yeah. just shoot me an email and uh, yeah, uh, happy to, to jump on MS Teams or Zoom and, and discuss this further. Okay, great. More questions? Let's uh, thank our speaker. A Alex, I'll be in touch to connect uh, you with Ola. And, and Jeff, yeah. if you'd like to join that discussion, please let me know. We can make it forward. Yeah, 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 no, I, I definitely would. I mean, this is, as you know, I'm I'm getting heavy into this kind of stuff. So I'd be quite interested. Great. So I, I, I'll, uh, I'll send out an email to the group uh, soon. And please work with Eugene to make sure the slides and the recording are up on CDAR and send it to everyone. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. And thanks again for inviting me around. So this this was great. Uh, great questions. Great input for me uh, to polish the paper further. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.
Yeah, great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining next week. Our own Shawu Dai will be talking about uh, learning in economics and market design. Uh, so uh, see you guys next week. And uh, thanks, great. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a nice day, everyone. <laughs> Bye.